Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Uh, good evening to those tuning in from the West Coast, which will be 11 p.m. To those in the East Coast, where Sarah is from, it's 2 a.m. And to those in Palestine Standard Time, it is 9 a.m. in the morning over there. Uh, my name is Edward Hong. I will be this panel's moderator. I represent sag and Sister Guild members for Ceasefire, and my pronouns are he, him, his. I am zooming in from the traditional territory of the Tongva, Tataviam, and Chumash tribes. All struggles are interconnected throughout space and time, and as such, we acknowledge the genocide and atrocities faced by the indigenous people here on Turtle Island. And we must also acknowledge the ongoing genocide and atrocities our brothers and sisters are facing in Palestine. Welcome to session number 12 of 24 Hours for Palestine, Silencing Voices for Palestine in Hollywood. Today, I am joined by some truly incredible artists that will speak on this topic, which include filmmaker Rola Selbach, and actors Miriam Ali Ahmad and Sarah Alami. Um, I just want to give pass it off to you in terms of just introduce yourselves in terms of what you do, what you're proud of, and then we'll just run off to the bases with the questions. I will pass it off to Rola. Hey everyone, uh, thank you so much, Edward, and thank you so much to everyone putting this on. This is absolutely incredible. The energy has been amazing. I couldn't be more privileged and more proud. Um, so my name is Rola Silva, a Palestinian uh, filmmaker here in Los Angeles, uh, film and TV, um, and uh, yeah, and happy to be with uh, here with with you all, Sarah. Hi, my name is Sarah Alami. I'm a Palestinian actress. Uh, my father was born in Palestine, 1944, and I've been uh, advocating for Palestinian human rights for a very long time, and I've always felt ignored. So to have this community, I'm so grateful for all of you. So nice to be here. And Miriam? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here uh, in the presence of such amazing human beings and artists and um yeah, just human beings. Um, I, um, I'm a Lebanese actor. Uh, I grew up in Lebanon, then moved to Los Angeles um, uh, towards the end of 2020. And uh, I've also been very much immersed in the Palestinian fight for liberation for a very long time. And I want to be dedicating my career to, to this. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Uh, we're going to hit right off with the questions. I know this is generally about the talk of censorship and whatnot in Hollywood, but I was inspired earlier by basically this foolish notion of hope. And I know in our Hollywood industry, it, it is anything but hope because of how incredibly Zionistic our industry is. But I don't know. I feel I feel like instead of going right into what you know, what can we do to fight and struggle this, what got you into your profession in the first place? What's your what was your dream, your passion? to become an artist. So starting with Rola again, what got you into being a filmmaker? Yeah, I think as I was a kid, uh, I actually grew up in Abu Dhabi and um, I, I just completely fell in love, not just with film, but with filmmaking. My dad uh, came home with like the big VHS cameras, like, you know, for birthdays and whatever. And I completely hijacked it, uh, <laughs> pun intended. And I uh, and I just started dressing up my siblings in you know funny outfits and making music videos and, and films and all that stuff. And so when we moved to the U.S. after the first Gulf War, I'm like, hey, there's no way I could be a filmmaker, right? Right? And so I, I just ended up um, really pursuing it independently uh, while I was doing my studies and just kept making film after film after film after film uh, until finally I um, uh, kind of catapulted on the scene a few years ago in, in the independent film scene and then went into TV. But I think the reason why I went into uh, film in the first place is to tell stories. And I think stories is the only proof that we ever existed. And I, I figured that out at a very, very young age. Uh, it's the only proof we have that we are here. So storytelling is existence, is resistance. And that's why I love it. Sarah? Um, so how I got into film, uh, film <laughs> or the Palestinian movement. Um, cause I, like, you know, Rola said right now, it's, it's, I feel like storytelling is just kind of what we do. We are born to have this resistance. We are born with this pride. Like if you knew, if you knew a Palestinian family, you would walk in that house and they would feed you and they would dance and they would just laugh and tell you stories. And it's such a beautiful culture. And 
I also saw the heartache, um, the pain that my family was going through, you know, like my father now at 80 years old, knowing that he survived the Nakba, that he's older than the state of Israel, that he survived the six day war, that his family is still there. I mean, 80 years old, he cries like, what am I supposed to do for them? What can I do? And he, and there's this guilt because my father left because he was jailed, he was beaten, and he couldn't take it any longer. And there's this guilt that your family is still there, family is still going through it. And we, we have a duty and obligation to fight for them. And when it comes to Hollywood, you know, it is about telling stories, making people feel something. So why in this moment, when we are telling the most important story of our life, why would we be silent? That's beautiful. Miriam. Yeah, so uh, how I got into, I'm also going to touch on both subjects, how I got into acting and then how I got into the Palestinian uh, cause for liberation. Um, as a child growing up, I was like super shy, uh, introverted. My mom kind of forced me to do theater classes to get out of my shyness. Didn't really work. Um, but I fell in love with theater and um, and acting and found really my my way to express myself and, uh, you know, tell the stories that I want to be telling. Um, and so this is how I sort of uh, went into acting. Um, in terms of like the Palestinian um, fight for liberation, I, you know, Rula and Sarah are bo both Palestinian. I'm, I'm not Palestinian, I'm, I'm Lebanese. Uh, but, you know, for me, Sarah was just mentioning how like the culture and all of that, it's, it's also in the Lebanese culture. We're like very similar. I'm not, we're not the same, but like we're different, but we're the same. And, you know, coming the, the West divided us, divided and conquered. We were all one country. And so like, to me, in my mind, like Lebanon is Le Lebanon and Palestine, right? like we're, we're one just like Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Palestine, we're all this one big entity. And um, but just like there's a difference between the north of Lebanon and south of Lebanon, there's a difference between Lebanon and Palestine. So that, that's the way I see it. And also Lebanon has a you know shared history with Palestine, the south, and my family is from the south of Lebanon. So the south has been uh, occupied for 20 years, had been occupied for 20 years. And uh, Beirut was also occupied and invaded and so we share a lot of the same history, of course, of course, not saying that, you know, it's it's not the same, but, um, you know, I can I can relate in that in the in these terms. Um, but also just uh, growing up, I was also always immersed in the Palestinian um, cause. So um, and having lived a little bit of that in the 2006 war in, in Lebanon, um, I sort of, and I was still very young, but I, I, I got more into it and just seeing it as one of the most horrifying injustices in our world. Um, I just find it that, you know, you cannot, you cannot just disregard it no matter where you're from, no matter, um, no matter your background, but of course, you know, being from, um, from Lebanon and uh, being immersed in that definitely, you know, it 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 hits differently. So yeah, that actually is a wonderful transition because we're gonna get right into basically what brought you into Palestine liberation work, which I know in our industry is an extremely difficult thing to do, let alone even talk about. Uh, but thankfully, obviously, in the past nine months, we are very much talking about it, unlike any time in history. I don't think in the world, let alone Hollywood, that we have talked about Palestine to this degree, to this you know, enormous uh, potential. So when for basically for all of you, how long have you been doing it? Uh, what, um, so I'll pass, I'll start with Rola. Yeah, um, so it's very interesting because even though I have a Palestinian background um, and I have also a, a, a very, very um, revolutionary, specifically revolutionary women, uh, Palestinian women in, in my lineage, like my teta, basically speaking of Lebanon, my teta was kind of like we we, uh, we call her like the mini Harriet Tubman because she would actually um, shepherd refugees from the north to Lebanon uh, during the Nakba. 
Um, uh, and then my auntie Nabila worked very, very closely in the uh, uh, in the refugee camps, also in Lebanon. Um, you know, with with UNRWA, uh, mostly focusing on family and kids. Um, and she, uh, uh, you know, tragically was killed, um, uh, unmartyred, I should say. So um, even though there's so much revolution in, and revolutionary, um, amazing revolutionary people in in my family. Still, when I was told about Palestine uh, when I was younger, just like any kid, right? Your parents tell you, especially my dad, he tell me about, you know, Balfour Declaration and he'd Sykes-Picot and Nakba and all that stuff. I'm like, yeah, but there's no way. There's no way that the British just get, you know, when I was a kid, I'm like, oh, I'm sure there's something. Else. I'm sure there's an exaggeration. I'm sure my dad's exaggerating, just like he exaggerates about everything, right? But it wasn't until I became a teenager and into adulthood that I'm like, not only was he not exaggerating, first of all, he covered a lot of pain up because he didn't want that pain to, you know, uh, um, come down to us kids. Um, but secondarily, uh, I realized that this is not new. This is not an exception. This is colonialism. Yes, <laughs> the British decided, you know, just like you said, Mariam, like, you know, oh, I know, we'll cut this up and we'll give this to this person and we'll give this to this person. And it is just that callous and it, it is just that disgusting. So um, once I became a teenager to adulthood, as I was getting into my filmmaking, I was also uh, uh, getting my ed very, very, very um, needed education on Palestine. Um, and so I've been doing this since for, for decades, I would say for 20 years, ever since I've been doing film. Uh, I haven't been quiet about it, but it's only been the past nine months that i um, you know, that I've been extremely, uh, every single piece of my work that's been put out has been about Palestine. And because of that, I for sure uh, face retribution, as I'm sure a lot of folks on this panel have, which we'll talk about in a second. But yeah, but that's kind of how I came into it. It's interesting how both my education on Palestine and filmmaking storytelling kind of um, uh, emerged at the same time, actually. That's awesome. Hmm. Sarah? I love how she brings up family right now, right? Because anyone I think who is from the homeland, like we have just this beautiful history and part of my family. Uh, my family is a very well-known family. It's the El Alami family. And we have incredible, I mean, paperwork that dates back years and years. My ancestor in the 12th century fought the crusaders and he actually spread islam throughout palestine and because of this we were awarded uh, an incredible amount of land in jerusalem and other parts and throughout the history throughout the, the occupation um you know it, everyone talks about like these keys that you have but you can't have access to it my family they do not have money. They are barely getting by. And in reality, they really, they own so much land that they should be wealthy, but um, it, we don't have access to the land that, that we, you know, had. And there's so much, you know, when people say like, oh, you're not indigenous. I'm like, my literal DNA results say that I'm from Palestine. They literally say that. Um, so, and I know my family and, and the rich history behind it. Um, but also transitioning to the whole Hollywood aspect. Early on, I, I remember a few people speaking out and anytime anyone ever brought up support for Palestine, human rights, equality, they would be vilified and their jobs would be threatened. I mean, I remember specifically Mark uh, Ruffalo, this happening to him years ago and people get really uh, scared. You know, media plays a huge role in, in how others see us. And we are always depicted uh, as terrorists or uh, the bad guys or like just the joke, you know, we're always like, joke. Um, we're never really given a lead role. And um, I want to change, I want to change that. I want to bring change. I, and I want to be able to freely be able to criticize a foreign government and not have to risk losing your livelihood. And if not for me, if, if I don't see it in my time where I don't get to, you know, have those roles, I hope that the generation coming up of younger Palestinians um, are not afraid to be proud of where they're from and they won't be vilified for speaking out. 
thank you both of you guys for sharing all of that. Uh, super inspiring. Um, I'm I had a sort of a similar experience as uh, Rula as well as I was getting more into the acting career and the in the uh, in the industry. I was also uh, gradually learning about Palestine, and you know we still do. We we're still learning a lot more, and it's crazy how much how much we don't know and how many more horrifying stories we can find out. And um, so, yeah, so basically my, my, I always had that sort of feeling that I have, I have a role in this that, you know, as a citizen of the world, as an Arab, um, I have a role um, in the Palestinian fight for liberation. And uh, as Edward mentioned it previously, you know, all our struggles for liberations are uh, for liberation are interconnected. And um, whether whether people are able to see it or not, everyone is affected by this, um, whether directly or indirectly. So. Um, so, yeah, from a very young age, um, I sort of. I, I wanted to do more. I, I, I couldn't I, I couldn't I felt like I couldn't just stand still in front of all these injustices that were happening. And um, it, you know, the passion and the motivation was uh, fueled more and more as I learned more, as I as I grew older, as I got more into the business. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I, I feel, and I am, I am a very privileged person. I, uh, I was able to leave Lebanon because I have the US citizenship. So I was able to leave Lebanon, I, I speak, three languages so i feel like it is my duty to um to serve that to 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 really honor all those privileges and use them in the right way uh to speak up um and also i i also feel what what sato is talking about about you know the misrepresentation of arabs in uh in the media the terrorism versus victims that's all we're portrayed as um so i really want i'm very interested in in stories of life and stories of love and you know there's so much more to us so much more to our culture and people um that i want i want to share it with the world i want people to see it and uh i want people to also you know, with also the hopes that the people get inspired to also um, do something about it. Yeah. This is the one topic I think I, as a moderator, will actually chime in on this when you were saying that all struggles are interconnected. This is my part in it, though I am not Southwest Asian. Uh, being a Korean American in terms of where our colonized history is that we were considered terrorists by the Japanese occupiers because we dare to defend ourselves, we dare to resist, and so we were called terrorists by them. And so the notion of what it means to be someone who fights for freedom and someone who is considered a terrorist is a very flimsy thing. It's just determined by whoever is quote-unquote on top, on in charge, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily the truth, nor is it like the this is how it's supposed to be. And so I think I know that for me, I've always been since I was a kid, a loudmouth in all things. And in when you were Rolo, when you were saying in education, that is how we learn about resistance. That was how I learned about Palestine through college, because mm -hmm. I was part for what for the most randomest reasons, which we will not have time to get into. I was part of our college's Muslim Student Association. And so that is where I learned about Palestine for the first time. You know, like most people in Western, you know, who lived a Westernized lifestyle, our notion of Palestine or just Middle East is that they're all a bunch of terrorists. That's basically what it is. And so when I learned that was not the case, even back in 2000, this, what was this? This was 2007. That was when I first learned about it. As one of those mind blowing things, along with just learning about Asian American history, because I do think Palestine is part of Asian American history, like our struggle of like how the Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, the Indians, how they struggle to resist is the same with Palestine and the Middle East and how they've been like subjugated to Western powers and just uh, just annihilated in that sense and just and all of that. And so I think. I spoke about it, spoke out about it, even when I came to Hollywood and I knew that my whatever bridges I had quickly got demolished probably around 2012 when I just made a very public Facebook post that got 
a lot more traction than it did. And I just straight up said that Israel is the second largest legal terrorist organization in the world. That did not go well with many. I got phone calls from my reps. I got emails from casting directors warning me <laughs> that I will never work in this town again. And so my my rep had to quickly do some damage control and just be like, oh, he didn't mean that he was just he was drunk on Facebook or whatever. And I, I just I just want to tell him, no, that I do sincerely believe that. And I'm glad to see that after all these years, now more people are saying Israel is a terrorist state. I'm like, <laughs> it is OK. Let's just like, let's just accept that fact. And so um, I think we're going to get into the next part, which is. Have you faced retaliation for using your voice? And if so, how did you over overcome it? And this one, I leave it up to you all, whoever wants to answer. I could probably start just because it's the most probably um, uh, uh, blatant um, kind of retribution I've ever had. Um, so my agents dropped me uh, a few months ago. <laughs> so CAA, which is obviously the same agents that uh, tried to drop Maha Dakhil, as we know, uh, they demoted her. And if it wasn't for Tom Cruise, obviously, she would not be there anymore. Um, they made her take some sort of, you know, uh, sensitivity classes and, you know, Jewish sit-in, I don't know what else, like some sort of very, very, um, which in and of itself, obviously, is very important to learn. But within the context of what, you, when you call this a genocide, it is now anti-Semitic. I think that is extremely, extremely offensive. Uh, if I was a Jewish person, I'd be offended as hell, to be c completely honest. So, um, so anyway, so same agency. Uh, so they dropped me a few months ago. Obviously, for folks who who may or may not know, um, I've been using my my filmmaking to actually create these kind of short um, documentaries um, uh, at specific moments of what's been going on in Palestine. Uh, and I've been very vocal, uh, just putting my own self out there and and giving my 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 um, my opinions and my thoughts. And uh, yeah, and I got dropped like literally right after pitching to Netflix. And um, so it wasn't like. I wasn't, you know, actively working. Uh, and so there you go. But I, I do want to say one thing that actually both, I think, uh, Miriam and Sara talked, um, touched upon, which is um, Hollywood, uh, sorry, which is the vilification of uh, 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 Muslims, Arabs, and Palestinians, right? Uh, and how um, there is only one reason why you, Edward, uh, when you actually went in, you know, when you first got into the Muslim Association or whatever it was in college, why before that, all your impression was, uh, was that, hey, they're all terrorists and they're all, you know, bad or, you know, whatever it is. There's only one word and one reason for that. Only one. And that is Hollywood. There's only one reason. Only one. That is it. You didn't learn it in school. You, you saw it on TV. You saw it in the movies. And so that's how we know that that actually storytelling, specifically through movies and TV, is extremely powerful. And I would almost say it's even more powerful than, you know, whatever 2,000 pound, you know, bombs that we're selling to, to Israel or donating to them uh, as aid. So, so that's why I think that, you know, what we're all doing here on this panel is extremely powerful and why we know it's powerful, because this is exactly what we've been doing for nine months, is actually telling our stories, right? Uh, and because of that, the tide has shifted in the most unbelievable way, just like you said, Edward. I've never, I never thought I'd see, you know, I don't know, Jenny in Seattle, like, you know, putting up a, a Palestine flag and understanding why she's doing it. And understanding why she's doing it, not because it's a trend for two, three weeks, not because it's something you put on Instagram, I stand with Palestine, because she knows why. So that is the power in storytelling. Um, and yes, so I got dropped and, uh, you know, good riddance to them. So uh, whoever wants to go next. Yeah, well, I, I lost my agent, Edward, you know this. because <laughs> um, My agent dropped me as well. Um, I lost work. I lost people who I thought were friends. Um, but I... I for like for me losing a job is like or friends is better than losing my dignity um I gained way more than I lost like I see the good in people and I I see all of you here tonight willing to learn and willing to make change and that's a beautiful thing and it's better than anything I lost um, as we so say in, in Arabic sorry as we say in Arabic go ahead. <laughs> that's it like that <laughs> um yeah yeah that's uh you know I, i'm newer to la so i have I, i've been there for only three years and a half so um 
I'm not as established as you guys in the industry. So the the stuff that I've faced, uh, or I mean, I still face some some stuff, but it's not as like I don't have an agent, so I didn't lose an agent. Um, so, um, uh, but but you know, I've uh, I've faced a lot of um, a lot of discrimination and and uh, disgusting comments, um, specifically when I was putting up. Um, my show, Handelau, shit, where you've seen um, about Palestine and Hollywood at the Hollywood French Festival. The festival was great. Uh, it was just some people that were part of the festival that uh, made some horrible uh, comments, which I was able to report, actually. And, you know, there was a rather well system, uh, you know, considering uh, relatively to Hollywood as well. Um, but, uh, but anyway, as Sada was saying, like, also to me and I've, I've heard like a lot of my family and friends you know kept telling me you know stop being too vocal and I, I was vocal you know before obviously before October 7 but um you know I had always been very vocal so and and I'd received those comments like you know you have to be careful you're in Hollywood it's full of Zionists you're not gonna you're gonna not gonna get a job you're you'll ruin your career and so on but you know for me it's just you know if those like I don't, I don't care. I don't want to be. If if those people um, will censor me, I don't want to be working with them. I don't care to work with them. There's different alternatives. We we're, we're finding community. You know, there's not just Hollywood and that's it. Not just whatever the Zionists control. We can create an alternative, and we're cre and we created. We've been creating an alternative for that. Um, where our voices are honored and uh, our stories are given the, uh, the the value that they deserve. Um, so yeah, to me, it just it, I really don't care. Just you know, losing those very banal things um, is is worth it. I would not want to lose my dignity as Sada said. Yeah, I think it's actually interesting having you be part of this kind of medium is that like for someone who is recently in like in Los Angeles doing the acting thing, it would be a different experience to those who have been doing it. And then you know, the years of, let's say, the industry connections that you've had all of a sudden get tested during these times of just who is on your side and who is going to be like, well, fuck you. So it is interesting that you came along. this, And in some ways, I think you kind of represent like the newer generation of it like we are like ever since 2020 with the global black lives matter movement we are seeing a change in terms of what we speak out against and the people we're willing to be like you know what we don't need these people like and that's what 2020 for many of us have taught us and i think in a in a way and like i was saying earlier tying it all back that all struggle is interconnected that when black lives matter happen and when the movement happened Many of like, this is where it's like all the white people who were saying they were all for Black Lives Matter did not pay attention to what Black Lives Matter were actually saying. Like in their documents, they talked about Palestine. Palestine is very much interconnected with BLM. And so for those who are all of a sudden like, oh, my God, what are they doing all of a sudden? I'm like, I guess you didn't pay attention. You didn't pay attention 20, you know, back four years ago that this is all connected. So you didn't fall. That's not our fault. That's your, that's your fault. And so I think you brought up Handala, which I think in a way shows, or we're going to talk about it too, shows in terms of what we can do to create projects that celebrate our identities or celebrate resistance and actually find an audience. Around. Yes, like you said, Miriam, that there were people who did not appreciate it, but there were a lot of people who did, especially the Hollywood Fringe Festival that was the one who gave the scholarship in the first place. But and before I talk even more further, tell us a little about Handel and your experience creating your solo performance at Hollywood Fringe Festival. And by the way, shout out, she won the best solo solo show award for the Hollywood Fringe Festival. So, woo -hoo -hoo. all right, take it away. Thank you, Edward. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, it was it was great. You know, winning the best show, solo show. I was not expecting that, and especially that also like it's th th that that award. It was voted voted by you know the French community, the the participants and the people who went and watched all those shows. So that that just like it meant so much, you know. To to first of all. 
I'll go back to the beginning. I'm starting from the end. Uh, first of all, to be able to put in a show at such a huge theater festival in Hollywood, winning the scholarship to be able to put that was already like I was I was very surprised and you know pleasantly surprised, obviously, that um, that the festival was was on our side. Um, you know, they gave the scholarship to me, and um, they were very supportive throughout. Um, so anyway, Handala and the show and how it started. I actually, I, I, I did a very, um, so Handala is a, just to give you a, a brief description of it. It's a solo theater performance, uh, that I wrote and, uh, performed. Uh, I also produced for the Hollywood Fringe Festival. Um, and, uh, it's sort of, it started out as a, it, it's an hour long right now an hour and 10. Um, but it started out as a 12 minute solo performance that I had put on, um, May of last year. So uh, before the big genocide started, um, and it was part of my acting training. I took a solo performance show and I wanted to put, I wanted to talk about Palestine and because I knew the, how, you know, how little people knew about Palestine. And um, so I put on a 12 minute show um, and, you know, the, the response was was overwhelmingly great. And a, a lot of people approached me and were like, thank you so much for educating us and so on. So um, now and then I, I wanted to put it in the Hollywood French Festival last year. I, it just didn't happen. And then a, after everything that happened started starting October 7, um, I decided that, you know, it's definitely the time to to take it forth and put it in the festival. Um, but obviously the purpose had shifted because m a lot of people are now more aware. Um, so the the purpose shifted from, you know, bringing awareness to um, reclaiming the stories, reclaiming um, our narrative and um, challenging that, that terrorist victim narrative that we see in Hollywood um, and just celebrating Palestinian life because, uh, you know, as obviously as important as it is to, to keep mentioning the horrors that, that happen, it's also very important to remind ourselves what we're fighting for and to, to, to bring that, that joy and that, um, those, those stories that, that really celebrate the life uh, and the beauty of Palestine and the Palestinian people um so um putting it up i ha I, I interviewed a few palestinian people collected stories and compiled them into to, uh into one solo show um and um the we had at the different shows we had we had vendors uh from the swana community um you know we wanted to put in just give give um um, a platform for these for these vendors. Um, also, it was you know putting on my team was also great. It's a solo performance, but obviously you know there's a huge team behind it. And uh, I want to give a huge props to my uh, to my two directors, uh, Becca Khalil and Mahmoud Abu Bakr, um, who did amazing with it. Did an amazing work work with that with the with the show. And also at the end of the show, we had a depke session where we, where we taught the whole audience how to depke, and we had a whole depke session. And the the um, the vendors were still on selling the the stuff. Um, all the proceeds are going to um, to support a, a Palestinian family in Gaza, um, and um, hopefully, not hopefully, um, we are taking uh, Handala to uh, the Ken Ball Festival in Philly in September, and then we're taking it to different places, hopefully. Uh, so there's like plans to keep going with it. Um, but yeah, winning the best solo show was incredible. I was, you know, on that stage, I was like, you know, looking for those Zionist tears in the crowd, like, where are you? Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, and we had, we were only allowed to say two words when we were accepting the award. And obviously our two words were free Palestine. We had the Palestinian flag and it was great. It was awesome. Yeah. I think your story in terms of how creating Handala and just how you how tech, you know, even though it's not necessary for an institution to accept you, but it helps to have the Hollywood French Festival accept you is a telling sign that 
you know, when people would be like, there's no way you can speak out against the government of Israel and actually get away with, you know, actually keep working. There is. I think this is a sign that there is a path forward. And it may not be the mainstream path, but then again, you know, as we learned from 2020 and beyond, there was just like anything where it actually means something cannot be done the mainstream way. It just can't. Like whether you represent as a woman, a person, like everything has to be done elsewhere because otherwise the stories will just not be told. There's just too many old white people in charge right now and they still are in charge to actually get anything done. Uh, on that note, I want to switch it off to Sarah, and I know that in you know for for a long time, and especially in the nine months, uh, you have actively been using your social media platform to talk about what's going on in Palestine and the horrors and the atrocities. And though there are so many grim things that we all see every day, and especially what you see, what has been some of the beautiful things that did come out of it? Well, definitely the relationships, you know, um, like I said, because I, I feel like I've been trying to raise awareness for so long. And I I felt I have felt so segregated, honestly, and less than and I, I hate to say it, but I, I really feel like there there is in ways favoritism in in our union sometimes. Um, our, our union president has raised over $60 million for Israel in 2018. And this was after they had already killed, you know, thousands of Palestinians. And it was such a disproportionate number that anyone can see by looking at the numbers that there's something, you know, clearly wrong. Um, and then, you know, they released a statement uh, right away in support of Israel. It's been nine months into a genocide and no one has said anything. Um, so I just feel like I was very lost I felt so alone. I didn't understand how I can see the suffering of so many people and that I knew for so long that what was really happening, I, I had a gun to my head at 12 years old because I was visiting my, my cousins in Palestine and we went down a road that we weren't allowed on because Palestinians have a certain license plate that says you're Palestinian. It's like having a, a, a mark on our back and at 12 years old, I was terrified and that's when I really knew something was wrong. And so I, I just always felt like, looked at like, 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 like an animal or something like people look at us like animals and I never understood it. I never understood it. And, um, I, I feel like I've been screaming into this void and no one has been listening for all of these years. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing signs that say free Palestine. I literally am FaceTiming with my family in Palestine, showing them because they, they have this thought that America hates them because what our government has done. And I'm like, no, the people love you. And I'm seeing it for the first time. And my father, like being 80 years old, and he lives in Chicago in a place called Little Palestine. And he went to a rally and he's like, he's like crying because he cannot believe that people actually love him and care about him. We've never seen this in our in our life fighting for Palestine. We've never seen people care. So the beautiful thing that has come about this is that people know who we are now. They know our struggle um, and they see our fight and they're joining our fight with us. Absolutely. Oh, uh, I I just remember a random a memory was like when October 7th happened, I was having lunch with an Iranian actor friend, a wonderful man named Ryan Shrime, um, who we saw what was happening and we you know we've known each other for years we've always been outspoken about palestine and we were just like do we talk about it like do we really talk about it? even though this just happened do we need to talk about what happened before october 7th because i think people need to know the context of what this day was because obviously we saw all our mostly white friends hosting their flags and their sympathy and we're just like wow i guess they don't know anything they really don't know the history of it and then we realize you're like you know what fuck it we're just gonna just talk about it, it just became just this just talk about it every single day until you know our eyes bleed and whatnot but basically this leads into the next part which is 
we've all been talking, we've all been seeing the things, we've all been seeing the horrors and whatnot. How, what is one thing you are doing to take care of yourself during these times? Because obviously it's not ending anytime soon, but how do you take care of yourself during these times? I give myself grace. I feel like I am able to face this head on. I speak with intent. I, I am there to show people. I am telling the story of my family. And I am very intentional with what I put out. And if I want to show emotion, I'm showing emotion. And I give myself grace. It is hard for me. I had this discussion with my family. My family cannot see the images that I'm posting. And I had this talk with them. They are suffering. You have to understand, people from Palestine are suffering from severe PTSD and trauma. Those, those who survived the Nakba, those who survived the beatings, the, the kidnapping, everything. They are suffering from t PTSD. And seeing kids with their heads blown off is too much for my family to take. So that's why I did create a second account. And, I, and I'm constantly putting that out there. But I give myself grace and I know that it's okay. And I prepare myself mentally to, to educate people and to face what I'm about to see so that I can take it in and then I can relay my words with, you know, precision and again with intent and know that I, I will, I will make change and I, and I'm okay. And I'm, and I'm, I'm okay. And it's going to be okay. And we're going to make change and we're going to free Palestine. Yeah. I think, um, beautifully said, by the way, beautifully said, I think for me, um, I'm, I'm probably admittedly not very good at taking care of myself. Uh, but I think that's probably true for everyone on here. Cause, <laughs> but, uh, I will say that, um, I, I try my hardest to at least wake up in the morning and, and force myself to list things that I'm grateful and thankful for, because I think that's that's important to do no matter what we're doing. Um, but I also do think that um, it is important to, uh, uh, I would say that it's important to not be afraid to be vulnerable and to say when you need help and when you need to speak to someone. Uh, the reason why I say that is because I think, and, and I don't mean to speak for everyone on this panel, but what I've seen talking to a lot of people who um, have been educating, talking about Palestine, um, uh, whether they're small group or whether on social media, wherever it is, the number one thing that we are exhausted by is exactly what you said, Sara, which isn't the work. It isn't the work to educate. We're happy to. We want to tell you our stories. We want to ask us questions. If you're curious, we want to tell you. The thing that is exhausting is the feeling that we are being gaslit mm. and that we are screaming into a void and that we are alone. And they want us to feel that way. That is why they drop us. That is why they try to warn us, don't speak. Uh, uh, uh. They want to make you feel like you're on this little island. No one cares what you, you're saying. In fact, if you say it, they're going to think you're bad, you're awful. And so they want to make you feel this. And that is what, in my, for me, what I fight every day, more than anything. I'm happy to do the work. I will do the work 25, 26 to your point, uh, Edward, like till our eyes bleed. That's not, that's not what exhausts me. What exhausts me is the feeling of being isolated and the feeling of being gaslit and being alone. And so what I would say to that is the number one thing I found is exactly what we're doing now is being in community, being in spaces with people who understand and realizing that we are much bigger, much, much bigger than they are much bigger, not just in heart, not just in uh, purpose, but in numbers, in actual numbers. Yes, they happen to, you know, be, you know, at the top of some, you know, very big industries at this point. But that's it. And that means nothing because those industries need us. And when we take our stories and decide, like at the Hollywood Film Festival or any other place, take our stories outside of the system, trust me when I say they're going to come running to us because they're not gonna have any stories left of meaning. So that's what I'll say. Yeah, that's such such a beautiful way to put it, both of you guys. Um, I relate to that a lot. And I relate to, you know, not being great at taking care of myself. Um, but also, I think um, one of the most important things to me is, um, you know, just, with everything happening, um, 
just uh, you can feel so helpless. You can feel so um, useless. So uh, just reminding myself that I am doing something, that I am doing what I can. I I can't, you know, save the world. That's that's not something that I can do on my own. So I, I am playing my role, reminding myself of that. Um, also surrounding myself, as Udula said, uh, with community and like-minded people and going back to, to this unity and um, just showing them that, that we, we are big, we are powerful in numbers uh, when we're united. And that goes back to also what I had mentioned about, you know, the West dividing and conquering. Um, they want us to feel like we're different. They want us to, to be divided because that makes us weaker. So, you know, reminding myself that it's so important to, to be one, to, to really fall into that unity and, uh, you know, keep fighting, never, never drop your values at all. But that's the most important part. I can't say it any better than that. I think this is actually a great way to finish off our panel. Uh, as we finish our session, first off, I want to thank all of you for being part of this. Some of you, two of you, you know, we're, we're all late time. And for Miriam, 9 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m. over there? Yeah, well, now it's 10 a.m. 10 a.m., yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for being part of this panel. And thank you to Golden Third Productions for having us. This is an extraordinary event that I, you know, I just can't believe you guys put together through all the, you know, all the global majority artists to be part of this. So with that being said, I want to introduce the next panel, which uh, will be Nadia Ahmad, who is an activist and managing director of Loyak Lebanon, as she'll moderate the next session titled Feminism and Palestine, How Our Liberation is Mutual, Collective and Intertwined. For all of you tuning in, thank you so much for watching and free Palestine.